Hello, everyone, and welcome to EuroPCR 2021. My name is Ziad Ali from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center in New York. Talking about ultra low contrast angiography in PCI, looking at a special patient population the patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and those patients with end stage renal disease who may require contrast sparing approaches. Our session objectives today really focus around the fact that the leading cause of death in patients with CKD4 or 5 and end-stage renal disease is cardiovascular. It's also the leading cause of death after renal transplantation, and exclusion from randomized controlled trials has led to a real paucity of data in this area, making cardiovascular management in this patient population difficult. And it's important to recognize that not all CKD is equal. In fact, our usual cutoff for CKD of 90 milliliters per min per uh, 1.73 millimeters squ meter squared is probably an overestimation. And this study of almost 15,000 patients and a mean follow-up of 6.2 years, the level of GFR is actually an independent predictor of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And actually, you can see a graded risk of events based on the GFR, which increases dramatically the lower your GFR goes. And in fact, end-stage renal disease is not chronic kidney disease. In these 230,000 dialysis patients, you'll notice that progression from CKD onto dialysis portends a particularly poor prognosis. And so if we look at this more granularly, a 25-year-old with end-stage renal disease has the same annualized mortality as a 75-year-old general population patient. And that means it leads to this concept of renalism, meaning because of fear of advancing patients into end-stage renal disease, many practitioners avoid performing procedures that may be necessary or life-saving in this patient population. Renalism, coined by Glenn Chertow from Stanford University, is the concept that patients who require treatment aren't getting it. Here you can see a very clear indication for invasive management of coronary artery disease, i.e. a myocardial infarction, but only about half of patients who have a clinical indication, including myocardial infarction, are actually getting an invasive approach. And this is contemporary, because renalism even happened in ischemia. On the left side, you'll see that revascularization occurred in about 80% of patients who had an invasive approach in the ischemia trial, but in the ischemia CKD trial, only 50% of the invasive randomized arms actually got angiography, and only about 60% of patients who had an indication for revascularization after catheterization actually got revascularized. And the likely cause for this is the fear of dialysis. On the left-hand panel, you see that those patients in the invasive arm have a significantly higher risk, almost threefold, of going on to dialysis around the time of the procedure compared to the conservative arm. And on the right side, you see the reason for this is in fact because chronic kidney disease and the institution of contrast-induced nephropathy on top of that has a very high morbidity and mortality rate. And in fact, even those patients with no chronic kidney disease who develop contrast nephropathy have a poor outcome. So what is high-risk PCI? High-risk clinical and lesion characteristics in this 14,000 patient study from contemporary DS trials shows that CKD and end-stage renal disease is a significant hazard. And over the next series of presentations, we'll be talking to you about mechanisms and techniques to minimize the use of contrast, specifically in this high-risk patient population. I hope you enjoy this session. Hello, it's a great pleasure to share with you some, uh, this, this case on ultra-low contrast PCI. Uh, in a patient who has multi-lesion disease. These are my conflicts of uh, interest. Well, patients who present uh, multiple lesions uh, constitute a challenge uh, when uh, you have to perform PCI in a context where contrast administration should be minimized. So in this presentation, the aims uh, that we have set are to share with you some tools and maneuvers 
that reduce the dependence of PCI on contest administration while ensuring optimal reverse polarization. And this includes uh, the list of, uh, of uh, maneuvers and skills that you can see in the slide and that we will see over the case presentation. So this is a case that we are discussing. It's an 87-year-old uh, gentleman presenting with chest pain and recent uh, heart failure. You can see that the patient has multiple cardiovascular risk factors. Importantly, he has chronic kidney disease stage 3B and also COPD. The left ventricular function was normal and there was a light, slight elevation of uh, troponin I levels. This is the coronary angiography that revealed that there was uh, multiple issues in the left anterior descending coronary artery and also uh, very calcific uh, osteostenosis of the uh, left anterior descending coronary artery as well. So the first uh, skill I would like to share with you is uh, performing wiring of the vessels without using contrast. And for that, what we did is we displayed the previous angiogram in front of us, in front of me, so I could maneuver the wires very easily using this uh, information that I had from the previous angiogram. And actually with that, with the wires in place, I had a very nice outlining of the coronary anatomy. Second thing was uh, to perform the physiological examination of the vessel. And this, of course, can be performed without uh, induction of contrast. And actually, it can be obtained, you can, you can obtain uh, different levels of information. You can first learn about the functional impact of the overall burden of atheroma uh, in that particular vessel. Uh, you can then see the disease pattern. You can see here that there is a ladder uh, phenomenon, uh, different uh, steps. And then you can co-register uh, the image with um, your angiography, or in this case, to spare contrast, with the silhouette of the wire. And by doing so, we can see clearly that there are three separate regions uh, with a lot of hemodynamic significance, the steps in the ladder that we saw in the uh, IFR pullback that deserve treatment. So with this information and knowing that we will not be able to advance the IVOS, we performed a small injection just to uh, be able to predilate uh, critical aspects with a small balloon. And this allowed the passage of uh, IVUS. Now, another important trick, if you have this uh, single injection, you can use it then to, co to co register with IVUS. And by doing that, we realized that there were specific segments that require plaque preparation. There was uh, important calcification in the mid segment of the LED and also in the uh, proximal uh, segment of the vessel in the osteal location. And here you can see that we performed uh, plaque preparation with a cutting balloon. Next thing was, uh, of course, to perform um, a planning of, uh, of, of the case uh, of stenting, uh, assessing what was the result of plaque preparation. And here again, we are performing uh, a, a pullback, which in this case was co-registered using the same technique that we approached before, not with the angiogram, but with the silhouette of the, of the wire. And by doing that, we identified first uh, a landing zone uh, for the stent in the mid LED that was distal to the diagonal branch. Uh, we also identified the distal landing zone, and, and with these two measurements, we uh, established what would be the needed uh, length of the stent, and uh, we proceeded directly to stent because we um, noticed that there was a good um, result of the uh, plaque preparation performed with IBL. Uh, rotational angiography is something extremely useful because will allow you to understand if you have even expansion of the stent. In addition to that, you have stent enhancement that uh, gives you an impression if you have obtained good expansion of the stent, again, without the need to, provide, to inject contrast, and of course, uh, performed uh, additional measurements with IVOS. We noticed that there was a region that requested additional, that needed additional extent optimization. Once we have fixed that uh, the mid uh, segment of the LED, we um, move to investigate what will be the strategy in the proximal part of the um, LED. And then um, we realized that we probably had to treat uh, also the stents up to the left main. So we investigated how was the circumflex osteum. There was no plaque at the level of the um, circumflex uh, osteum, as you can see here but there was heavy calcification in the lady um, osteum. 
And for that reason, we decided to perform plaque preparation using a lithotripsy that you can see uh, here, again, sizing the balloon uh, on the grounds of the intravascular imaging. Uh, the preparation was very good. We could see that the uh, lithotripsy balloon was opening properly. So from that perspective, what we did is uh, directly implanted a stent. We performed pot, and after performing pot, we recross uh, with a wire uh, to the uh, circumflex. You can see that we are uh, doing this with the help, with the support of a double lumen microcatheter, and again, without uh, any need to perform uh, contrast injections. Only at a critical location, at a critical point, you can decide to make a path of contrast to uh, check what is the progress of, uh, of the intervention or to guide a specific uh, important uh, step. Uh, from then, uh, we took, uh, we performed a kissing a balloon uh, in the left, left main bifurcation, and then, of course, we optimized the procedure in IBUS, uh, making sure that uh, we have a complete opposition expansion of the stent in this heavily calcified uh, osteum of the left anterior coronary artery, coronary artery, left anterior descending coronary artery. Here you can see the, the, the good result that was obtained. These are some measurements obtained at the osteum of the LAD. As you can see, minimal stent area is eight millimeter squares, very good. And we had also uh, nearly 13 millimeter squares in the, in the left main. And before uh, calling it a day, we established what was the functional result of the intervention. It's very important in these uh, vessels that have um, a lot of diffuse disease. So for this, we again performed um, uh, um, a longitudinal assessment with IFR. And actually, this demonstrated a very good result, an IFR of 0.91, which is excellent for such a disease vessel. And we have treated all that had to be treated, all slow limiting stenosis. And actually, you can see that the value of IFR was very close to the one that we calculated uh, from uh, our original measurements. This is the final uh, angiographic result. So hopefully this case um, will be will have been useful in discussing a number of skills and tools that we have to minimize the administration of contrast uh, in patients like this one um, uh, who had uh, severe uh, chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much for your attention. Chronic kidney disease patients or complex PCI. Um, so, is this a general approach you're going for, or um, is this a specific approach just for CKD patients? It's a very good question. And actually, what we learned also from from uh, Greg Certo, uh, another uh, nephrologist, is that actually. Um, in some occasions, what uh, dictates the, the development of acute kidney injury actually is um, the, the subtended, say, uh, disease of the patient, you know, the, 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 the complexity of the patient itself. So in, my impression is that, you know, in frail patients, in patients in whom you anticipate that you are going to need to do a lot of um, interventional work, these uh, tools and these approaches are very important. We have to move from a contrast-guided PCI era, which you know, is what we have been doing for, for decades now, to a situation where we can always also be able to perform the PCI without this. And of course, there are specific situations where you have dissections that can be extended hydraulically, SCAD, um, or even CTO situations where you, you already uh, generate iatrogenic uh, dissections and you have to complete the procedure without making injections to make it safe. Javier, really nice case there, um, and, you know, putting the anatomy and the physiology together and also reducing the amount of contrast. But when we're putting all these techniques together, where, where do you draw the balance between the, the duration of the procedure and the extra time involved using these technologies um, versus, um, you know, um, getting the results at the end of the day? Because we know that with the physiology and anatomy, you're going to get a better long-term result. But the longer these procedures take, you know, is that adding an additional risk? Um, 
Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's the reason because we have to insist that it is uh, the safety of these uh, patients is not only from, say, reducing the amount of contrast, but also to look to the patient as a whole and to address all different um, causes that may be contributing to uh, injury in these patients, hypotension, for example. Uh, so the, co the whole concept of protected PCI uh, in these very complex, frail patients, I think is going to gain more and more weight. And we will have to approach it from a, a multidisciplinary fashion, so to speak. So, but my impression, and this is the, in a way the core of what we are discussing today, is that the more complex the patient is, the more likely that the quality of revascularization is poorer. So, you know, in a very complex patient, the interventional cardiologist feels very happy if he is able to go in, place a stent, go out, and not having harm in, during the procedure. But of course, in a case like this, for example, that means that you will have not pre made proper preparation of the lesions, and in the long term, this may pay off in terms of worse outcomes. So I think that that's part of, of, of the problem. I think that, you know, we have um, a, a number of other scenarios that we can move to, if you agree. And the next thing will be to see a case uh, that was performed by Ziad Ali, and where actually we will see the application of uh, the extreme application of these techniques to perform um, uh, nearly zero, for, uh, zero uh, contrast administration in a PCI bifurcation. So let's, let's go and see the case. Hello, everyone. My name is Ziad Ali from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And I'm gonna be building on what some of my colleagues have already been speaking to you about, but specifically focusing now on ultra low contrast PCI in complex bifurcation with a focus on physiology. Many of the steps that you've already seen by IVIS are applicable here, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to include those. These are my conflicts. Well, there are some special considerations for bifurcation PCI and CKD. Provisional stenting requires side branch wiring and rewiring the jailed side branch with a physiology wire, bailout techniques if there's significant side branch compromise, including stenosis and dissection. When a two stent strategy, side branch wiring, side branch stent placement, and post PCI assessment with rewiring of the jailed side branch with a physiology wire can be challenging. And of course, recrossing with an intravascular imaging catheter can also be challenging. So let's go through our case, which has many of the teaching points that are germane to bifurcation physiology guided ultra low contrast PCI. 70 year old male with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, end stage renal disease who's had a kidney transplant with a very high creatinine and an EGFR of only nine. Patient has been stable off dialysis for several years, presented with dyssion exertion and an abnormal spec stress test with evidence of ischemia, but a normal ventricular function. He was referred for diagnostic cardiac catheterization and ultra low contrast angiography and invasive physiological assessment. That angiography showed significant LAD and D1 stenosis. Now it's important to understand that hydration is critical to ultra low contrast PCI. But notice that in this patient, the end diastolic pressure actually coming into the case is extremely high. And therefore, in patients with CKD stage four or five, pre-procedural forced hydration is not recommended. And rather, targeted hydration should be performed based on the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. In this case, the patient's ultra low contrast angiography is based on a contrast volume to EGFR ratio of less than or equal to one. So we have only nine milliliters to perform our diagnostic catheterization. And this is the angiogram. The right coronary artery is normal. The nine cc's of contrast is diluted with six cc's of saline. The circumflex is a relatively non-dominant and small vessel, but the LAD shows significant disease at the bifurcation with a proximal osteostenosis in the diag, and a distal stenosis just past the bifurcation in the left anterior descending. The total injection of mixture was only 12 cc's. So we performed a stage zero contrast PCI of this complex bifurcation with HD IVIS imaging guidance and sync vision physiology co-registration. For more details, you can actually link on this and see the entire case. Now, there are some key steps to understanding and that can help your ultra-low contrast PCI. First, 
you'll notice that confirming guide engagement can be problematic. And one way to ensure that you are actually engaged is when you feel that the guide catheter is engaged to inject intracoronary saline. The saline, of course, conducts electricity and as a result is able to demonstrate that you are adequately engaged in the coronary. And here's an example if you look at the bottom right of an injection of 0.9% sodium chloride and you'll notice the EKG change that's consistent and confirms the guide engagement. The next thing that we like to do is actually use an anchor wire. The anchor wire can be confirmed either by saline or of course by taking a soft wire and placing it into any artery within the vessel. And by placing it into any artery, this allows you to anchor and then create a metallic silhouette of the coronary arteries. When doing main branch wiring, we like to use an exaggerated tip, which will J easily, because of course this is safe and minimizes the risk of wire perforation. When performing side branch wiring, our previously placed anchor wire can be pulled back and guided down the path of the main branch wire, and using the previous mask, we can therefore create a metallic silhouette of our lesions and our coronary arteries. Then we'll perform side branch physiology. Using our metallic silhouette, we advance the pressure wire, or omni wire in this case, past the lesion and do a spot IFR. Following this, of course, we want to perform a physiology pullback, which allows us to determine whether or not there's a focal lesion and whether or not we should be planning on a provisional or two stent strategy. Here, in this case, you see a simple focal lesion right at the beginning of the pullback run. Now, what's critical about this technology is that we can perform a sync vision with zero contrast co-registration. Here, by placing the wires next to each other and create, creating a metallic silhouette, and then pressing on the cine, you'll actually notice that we're able to perform an IFR sync vision co-registration. This is a critical step, allowing you to rapidly and accurately map exactly where the pressure gradients are and plan your procedure. When we perform main branch physiology, we also confirm ischemia by a spot IFR, and following this, perform a pullback again to determine whether the pattern of ischemia is focal or diffuse, helping us guide whether or not we should be using medical therapy to predominantly or a PCI strategy. In this case, both seem to be focal. Sync vision zero contrast co-registration is performed again by advancing the wire and pressing on cine. But in certain situations such as this, it requires some manipulation here you'll see that the sync vision has identified the wire being in the side branch, but a simple correction of this will actually allow the sync vision to accurately map the pressure gradients based on the wires that you've placed in the coronary arteries. This needs to be done manually, but remains highly accurate. And you'll see after we correct this sync vision guided co-registration and we click on enter, we see an accurate pressure gradient showing us exactly where the focal lesion is within the left anterior descending. And then we use other technology. And for example, here, after placing our stents, recrossing and kissing using device detection. Device detection allows us to ensure that we are accurately placed with our two stents and make sure that when we perform our kissing balloons, that the balloons are in the appropriate place. When we perform main branch DS deployment, we also use the device detection to ensure that our proximal optimization is within the margins of the stent and also to ensure that we are accurately placed with the side branch appropriate to the proximal optimization technique. And of course, device detection also allows us to optimize our final kiss with a proximal optimization technique. This ensures appropriate alignment of the balloon and stent, and then perform our final kiss and pot and rapidly move through our case. Of course, we want to do post-PCI physiology as we're not performing an injection. The Omni wire is an excellent wire to do this. It has amazing handling characteristics. And when we perform a post-PCI IFR and the LED, we see it to be 0.90. 
And when we move our wire rapidly and across jailed side branches easily and effectively, again, we perform a spot IFR, which identifies for us that we have resolved ischemia in both branches and had a successful procedure. Of course, we have not used a single drop of contrast, and we've now shown you a sync vision guided zero contrast PCI of a complex bifurcation. So CKD and bifurcation disease have increased risk of target failure. The combination of the two is likely magnitudes higher. Bifurcation PI is technically complex. In the setting of advanced CKD, it likely leads to renalism. Catheterization laboratory technology significantly impacts the ability to perform complex PCI in the subgroup, and sync vision physiology confirms the presence of ischemia pre-PCI and the absence of ischemia at the end of the PCI. Device detection allows accurate and precise placement of the devices, avoiding geographic miss, and the OmniWire's handling characteristics facilitate post-PCI physiology. Thus, ultra-low contrast, or in this case, zero-contrast PCI, is feasible and may be safely performed in complex patient cohorts. Thanks very much and enjoy your PCR. Well, this was a very nice uh, case. Um, Alex, would you like to comment specifically in this uh, situation of uh, performing two SN techniques uh, without performing contrast? What could be the, the main challenges that you would like to share with the colleagues and how to solve it, perhaps? Well, I think um, if you do bifurcation, um, uh, I think uh, rewiring is always the most challenging part, actually, if you have to go for rewiring. So making sure that uh, you have the proper rewiring technique and you are um, in the right um, lumen is, uh, in my opinion, very crucial. But um, here also um, stent boost and IBIS can be of great help. Uh, even, um, uh, in my opinion, a better help than the angiogram um, sometimes is. So. Um, I think um, you have to be aware that you are within the right lumen, and if you're not sure, you can reconfirm by IVIS or stent boost technique and take it from there. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Bilal, what would be your what impressed you more of the case? What what was the the the, the learning point that you would highlight in this very nice case by Ziad? I think uh, again, really, it shows that I'm uh, you know you. You can do complex procedures, um, you know, um, bifurcation procedures with, with really very good results using these techniques and putting the the physiology and the um, the physiology and the anatomy together um, can give you really an excellent result. Um, you know, Ziad highlights the fact that bifurcations generally don't do as well with increased target vessel failure. And we know patients with CKD have got increased target vessel failure. Um, putting it all together, um, you know, the data from the ultimate CKD study shows using IBIS in this group of patients significantly um, reduces your risk of target vessel failure. So for me, it makes sense to be using these techniques anyway in this group of patients. The added benefit is that you can reduce or you know or significantly reduce or in Ziad's case he's not used any contrast at all um, to reduce your risk of contrast induced nephropathy so putting all of these techniques and technologies which all of us have in the cath lab um, can you know improve the quality of the procedure you do and also reduce the risk of contrast induced nephropathy Javier. Fantastic. Yeah, that's very, that's very, very good. I fully agree with uh, with your comment, Bilal. I think this is it's been a great case, uh, and I think we should move now because Alex is going to share with us a, a very interesting uh, case that he performed. In this particular case, um, in, in a patient with multivessel disease. So let's let's have a look to it. So welcome from Stuttgart. My name is Alex Becker. I'm the head of the cath lab um, of the Robert Bosch Hospital. Today we are talking about ultra-low contrast PCI in multivessel disease, a topic we are very passionate about, and I would like to share our case with you. First, my conflict of interests. So we had an 82-year-old man presenting with typical angina. Um, he suffered from a severe coronary artery disease uh, with a PCI of the LAD RD1 bifurcation in an external hospital previous. 
He has an ischemic cardiomyopathy with a uh, reduced and recently worsened LV function, uh, and he also has pulmonary, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hypertension, persistent AFib, and a chronic kidney disease with an EGFR of 38. So I think um, everybody can agree that this is a patient we really want to use as much, as little contrast dye as possible. So this is the coronary angiogram showing a diffusely diseased right coronary artery as well as, as a diffuse, diffusely diseased left coronary artery with an ambiguous situation at the stented LAD diagonal branch. Um, and uh, so our strategy was first um, uh, to evaluate uh, the right coronary artery by IFR. In order to do so, guide engagement and body wire placement to mark the vessel was achieved without contrast um, using the previous angiogram. And um, um, as you can see, the IFR wire was positioned with knuckle tip to reduce the risk for perforation or sand side branch positioning. The IFR spot measurement was 0.97. The pullback confirmed no drift. And we used uh, four mil of one-to-one -one diluted contrast dye to make sure that the wire was um, uh, indeed positioned within the right coronary artery. So we, we were able to make sure that the right coronary artery was safe and not hemodynamically significantly uh, stenosed. For the left coronary artery, first we established a digital coronary roadmap, which was then used um, for wire positioning in the diagonal branch and the LAD. Um, the Varata wire um, was placed in the diagonal branch um, uh, using um, the uh, DCR and IFR spot chart as, uh, showed a significant stenosis of 0.8 in the uh, um, diagonal branch. IFR evaluation of the LAD was 0.88 showing a close but significant stenosis um, uh, so, in order to uh, get a better picture, um, we performed an uh, um, LAD IVAS IFR tree registration uh, using the DCR angiogram as template. The IFR co registration showed no significant stenosis with indistended bifurcation, with the main drop in the stented and post stented. Uh, section. Here you can see the um, IVAS pullback uh, with a um, diffusely diseased um, um, LAD uh, within the stent and within the bifurcation. But um, in the um, IFR co registration, um, uh, the drop was uh, only within the stand and post stand. In order to perform um, the PCI, we established a virtual PCI using the tri registration, first to define um, the stand size and positioning via IVAS. And the stent length um, via IFR co registration. So on the left side, you see here how we nicely were able to uh, establish the stent size and the stent length um, within a section uh, that was uh, not as badly diseased. The uh, uh, virtual PCI showed that treatment of this section improves IFR from 0.89 to 0.96. So um, stent implantation as well as post dilatation was achieved by stent enhancement and stent boost. So on the left side, you see the stent enhancement. Um, uh, we used the uh, um, previous established stent lengths um, via the virtual PCI 
um, and implanted a Synergy 2.75 20 millimeter stent and post dilatation was achieved by um, uh, an uh, 3.050 millimeter um, non-compliant balloon. So our next strategy was to evaluate the stented bifurcation via IVES co-registration and stent boost. And as you can, as you um, appreciate the um, uh, IVES co-registration, I found it very difficult to uh, um, define how the stent the bifurcation stenting was performed in the previous PCI. Um, uh, in the um, stent boost, we had the impression that stent stenting was uh, bifurcation stenting was not done properly. And um, I had the impression that as well, the LAD stent as the stent within the diagonal branch was not covering the ostium. And um, so since the LAD was uh, uh, not hemodynamically compromised, the patient with his 82 year old, uh, uh, with his 82 year, years of age started to be exhausted. Our decision was to go for a conservative treatment. In conclusion, um, we were able to uh, um, evaluate a, a diffusely diseased multivessel disease with using two mils of diluted contrast for the right coronary artery and five mil of contrast dye within the left coronary artery. Um, a complex assessment of multivessel disease patients with ultra low contracts is feasible. And I think what's the main topic here is that it's extremely important that you don't skip on uh, evaluating and hemodynamical assessment, especially in patients with uh, severe kidney disease. Um, a stage PCI with uh, good planning should be considered and technology and imaging together with a change of mindset um, uh, makes uh, ultra low contrast Virtual contrast PCI, and nevertheless possible. Thank you very much. I mean, this was a very, very didactic uh, case, uh, Alex. And I think that my first question, um, perhaps to share with the colleagues, is uh, on the use of diluted contrast. That I think that obviously was a very sort of efficient way of reducing the amount of, of, of contrast you give. Um, can you comment a bit about this? I mean, which are this, the, the, the segments of the case you do this? How comfortable you feel, etc. So we started this like uh, two years ago using diluted contrast and we did a number of um, experiments where we assessed how much contrast we really, we really need, uh, how uh, far we can dilute contrast in order to get a, a proper uh, image. And actually with the modern um, uh, technologies we have around, it's really amazing how much you can dilute, actually. So um, in a lot of times, if you have good picture, you can dilute one to two, actually. Um, at least you can go for one to one without even seeing that much of a difference to your um, normal contrast. So um, we do this now on a regular basis. Um, so if you have a rather um, a small patient, we go for one to two. Um, if you have a little bigger patient, we go for one uh, to one. But you already reduce your contrast by 50% at least. And of course, I, I, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, and it's, it's very clear that in multivessel disease, the most efficient way perhaps to uh, reduce contrast administration is uh, avoiding unneeded interventions, of course. I mean, that's uh, extremely important uh, that you can reduce the number of lesions that you have to treat and to focus only in those who are flow limiting, right? And I think that's that, that that was the main point I wanted to make here, because I think a lot of people, um, if they go for uh, chronic kidney disease patients, they like to skip stuff because they are afraid because uh, they have to use contrast dye. So they don't go for the uh, hemodynamic assessment. They go don't go for the IVAS assessment. In this case, you would have ended up with a rather complex bifurcation PCI with not a lot of benefit for the patient, uh, which in my opinion would be the greatest danger for uh, developing um, uh, contrast-induced uh, acute kidney injury. 
Um, so, um, especially in these very uh, sick and very um, um, like vulnerable patients, it's very important that you don't skip and you do a proper assessment and then decide what the risk cost benefit is. I think that uh, brings the best result for the patient. Bilal, any comments on, on the case uh, by Alex? Yes, it's a really nice case demonstrating many different modalities to reduce the contrast. I mean, you nicely demonstrated dynamic coronary roadmap, roadmap as well as the um, uh, enhanced device detection. But the question I've got, Alex, to you is that, you know, where, where in terms of safety, the balance between safety and reducing contrast, where do you draw that line in terms of when you, you would give contrast in this group of patients? That's a great question, Bilal. So I'm not a big fan of zero contrast, for example. Um, uh, I think zero contrast is feasible, and if you can do it, it's okay. But you should never compromise. So if you have um, a bad feeling, if you're not sure if you did a good job, I mean, injecting like diluted contrast dye is uh, not a big issue for the patient, in my opinion. Um, what these cases show is that you can do a, a very good um, assessment, um, even a better assessment using the new technologies than using the angiogram. But if you really um, are in trouble or are in doubt if there's any problem, I think it's not a big deal using some kind of contrast. And um, as Javier was pointing out, in my opinion, this is these are technologies not only for the chronic kidney disease patients, but it, these are this is a technology for all the very complex and um, um, uh, very frail patients anyway, um, because um, uh, I mean th these are technologies which which helps you performing the PCI nevertheless of the kidney disease. So, fine, thanks. Fantastic. Yeah, so let's uh, let's move now to the case that uh, Bilal has uh, prepared with us. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting case uh, in in this in that in a patient who requires, as frequently happens in patients who have renal disease, a plaque preparation due to severe calcification. Hello, and thank you to the organizers of EuroPCR for this invitation to talk about ultra low contrast PCI and the management of severe calcification. And we have a case in point presentation. These are my conflicts of interest. So the learning objectives are how to perform IVUS core registration in ultra-low contrast PCI, a step-by-step -step guide, management of severe calcification in ultra-low contrast PCI, and the challenges of severe calcification in ultra-low contrast PCI. So we've got a case of a 74-year-old gentleman with multiple comorbidities, including type 2 diabetes, cirrhosis, secondary to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and portal hypertension, and CKD stage 4. He's had two recent NSTEMIs in the last three months, which were medically managed. This is important because we know this group of patients um, are far less likely to undergo invasive assessment following myocardial infarction, and their outcomes are worse, a term known as renalism. He was readmitted with chest pain and non-ST elevation, acute coronary syndrome, and his ECG showed quite marked anterior T-wave inversion. Echocardiogram showed mild LVSD with hypokinesia of the anterior wall and the inferior walls. He was initially med medically managed and antianginal treatment was optimized. Despite optimum treatment, he remained significantly symptomatic and was listed for angiogram query proceed. This was his angiogram, which was performed, which shows severe calcification involving the LAD and tight stenosis of the proximal and mid-LAD. And we see collateral flow from the right coronary artery, which was a chronic total occlusion. There was a heart team discussion and he was deemed high risk for surgery. Um, his Mehran score was in 11, 11 and on the assumption of 100 mils of contrast was a 26% risk of CIN. We know these patients do worse if they develop contrast-induced nephropathy with a poor outcome in terms of morbidity and mortality. The patient was accepted for high-risk PCI using ultra-low contrast PCI techniques. So this is the setup which we have. Um, it's a two-consultant procedure and we have good images from the previous angiogram performed at a different time. And right radial approach in this gentleman with EBU 3.5 millimeter guide. The working views we were using was the PA cranial view, and we also had a PA cordal view and REO cordal. So if you see in the center of the picture, we've printed out these pictures, and they're going to be working in exactly the same angles. So the first challenge is guide engagement. So for guide engagement, we want to do this without giving any contrast. 
So in this gentleman, we can see quite marked calcification of the left main stem, which is our guide where we're aiming for. But we can do other techniques such as probing with the wire. And sometimes you can inject 20 mils of saline and we can see ECG changes there. So here we see that the guide is engaged now in the left main stem. So we wire the vessel using our roadmaps, but in um, this patient, we can see extensive calcification of the LAD. So we're tracking the calcium in the vessel, but also looking at our roadmap angiogram to see that we're going in the right direction following the LAD. And we will check this in more than one view. The strategy here was for upfront, ro upfront rotablation. So we used the turnpike spiral to go through the calcium to switch over to a fro floppy rotor wire. And it was quite difficult getting the turnpike spiral through the proximal LAD stenosis. And then we went over to perform ablation. And we used a 1.5 millimeter burr and 160,000 revs per minute. And we were able to rotablate the proximal and mid LAD. So the question can be raised that we're rotablating without giving any contrast. And also we haven't even done an IVUS up front here. It's difficult to do IVUS in very severely calcified vessels because the IVUS probe will not pass. So here we checked in different views and we were confident we were in the LAD using our previous roadmaps and also the calcification scene in the LAD. So following um, our rotablation, we then left the rotor wire in, wired the vessel with a workhorse wire, and then we did pre-dilatation with a 2.5 non-compliant balloon. And we can see here the significant wasting of the balloon seen in the mid and proximal LAD, suggesting that we're going to need more um, calcium modification. So we then went on to perform IVUS assessment. So the IVUS core registration is performed in the same views with continual screening and a manual pullback at around one millimeters a second. And while this is done, um, the software will automatically track the wire. But here we can see that we manually adjust that and we track from the most proximal portion of the guide scene down to the distal vessel. Then when we do the core registered run, we will be able to track the wire as the surrogate for the vessel and do our assessment for the core register. It's important the table position doesn't move while we do this. And we need to see the guide and the wire while we're doing this. When we assess our IVUS run, we then, when we do the pullback, we can see um, a distal landing zone. It's around a three to 3.5 millimeter vessel. And as we're coming back, we still see the significant calcification, sort of around 180 degrees plus 270 degree calcium here. And as we're coming more proximally, we see there's still extensive calcification that's going to require further um, calcium modification techniques. So the important thing is that in um, this sort of setting is that this technology can also be used for targeted calcium modification. So we can target the area which has got the most severe calcification using the technologies which we have available. Should also add that the IVUS catheter did not cross the mid LAD here, so we couldn't go into the more distal vessel because we're using the eagle eye catheter, which can be bulky. So we decide here for targeted calcium modification. We've marked the areas where you've got the most significant calcification, and we also know that there's a good distal landing zone just before the left main stem seen here, coming in with the wire in the circumflex. So we've now identified that there's four main areas where we've got 270 to 360 degree calcium, and we can use targeted IVL using shockwave. Following shockwave therapy, giving 20 bursts each of these areas, and we are able to rationalize our treatment because we know there's only 80 bursts in a balloon. Following the IVL, we take a non-compliant balloon, and now we can see that there's a good expansion using our non-compliant balloon, and then we are able to go and do our IVUS run post to look at the effects of the shockwave therapy. We do another co-registered run. And here, as we run through this now, we still see there's a um, 180 degree calcium and some nodular calcium distally. We were unable to get the IVUS beyond this last time, but now we can see good um, fracture seen in the calcium with the plates moving independently there. And as we come more proximally, we see more disruption of the calcium. So ultra low contrast PCI technique is also allows us to do targeted calcium modification in this group of patients. So now we're, um, the decision is what to do with the more distal area where you've got 180 degree calcium. And here we decide to treat this with a scoring balloon using a 3-0 scoring balloon distally. Once we've done this now, we're ready to stent. Now, um, for stenting, 
we can use the core registration to decide the size of the vessel, but also the length as well. And we track the proximal and distal landing zones here, and it gives us an idea of the total length. It's important because we'd be using two stents. We do not double wrap the diagonal branch, as we see here. So we first place our um, distal stent, and then we use a three millimeter drug eluting stent. And after positioning the, um, the, the mid LED stent, we then go and position the proximal LED stent. We've got challenges here because we have to position this very proximally close to the um, left main stem and the origin of the circumflex. So here we use two techniques. We use device detection to show that there's good overlap distally. And also we place a 2.5 millimeter balloon um, in the circumflex and inflate this to see where we are in terms of the origin of the LAD. Using this technique, we're then able to deploy the LAD stent and then we post dilate the proximal and mid LAD stents and perform our final IBIS assessment. Using the same technique with core registration, final IBIS run is done. And here we see that there's good stent expansion. There's no distal dissection. We see that there is some eccentricity in the mid LAD where there was that nodular calcium. Um, and also we see the proximal landing zone where the stent has landed just at the ostium of the LAD and the minimal stent area in this case was 6.5 millimeters squared where there was the eccentricity. Finally, the question is, you know, do we do an angiogram? Our practice is to give one single angiogram at the end and five mils of contrast was used for the angiogram at the end of the procedure to look for any complications. These are the learning points. Complex calcium modification techniques can be performed using ultra low contrast PCI techniques. CKD patients have got more severe calcific disease. Step-by-step, ultra-low contrast PCI algorithm can provide good results with minimum use of contrast media. And use of IVUS gives better outcomes in CKD patients as seen by the ultimate CKD study. Finally, a big thank you to the team who took part in doing this procedure. Thank you very much, Bilal, and congratulations to you and your team for, for this uh, fantastic uh, case. I mean, it certainly illustrates what... Uh, what we have discussed from the very beginning, uh, those patients who have uh, are at high risk to, to have uh, acute kidney injuries sometimes are the patients who pose the, the, the highest complexity in terms of treatment. And of course, uh, the, because of the association between calcification and chronic kidney disease, this is a very, very important point. Alex, uh, any comments on, on Bilal's case? Great case, Bilal. Um, very nicely done. Uh, very impressive. Um, I have one question. Um, if you do uh, um, uh, um, uh, IVL in these patients um, uh, and you do post-dilatation, um, I, I'm on, always concerned that you get perforation if you do uh, too much of post-dilatation because it's heavily calcified, it's fragmented, there are sharp angles. So um, how do you perform it? Um, I mean, you, you solved it a little by doing the IVUS uh, first, but... Um, how uh, much of post dilatation uh, or how much of um, previous stent implantation ballooning are you normally doing? Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's a valid concern. Um, but we, so after doing the shock wave, we just did a, a non compliant balloon um, inflation. And then we did the IBIS, and we could see from the IBIS quite well that actually, you know, you got, you got quite nice fractures that's going to allow the stent expansion. It's important that we don't go too aggressive with the post-dilatation in this group of patients. And we're looking for, you know, a, a minimal stent area that's going to give you good outcomes. And we know this data from the studies. So it's important not to be too aggressive with the post-dilatation. I mean, the other important thing is, you know, with um, there's more risk of perforation without adequate calcium modification. Um, and we've got the benefit of having the IVUS before and after um, so, so far, you know, with our, our experience of shockwave in heavily calcified patients and in the ultra low contrast, um, you know, fortunately, we've, we've had a couple of balloon perforations, but we haven't had um, any vessel perforations with this, Alex. Bilal, you, you have extensive experience in performing ultra low contrast, even zero uh, contrast uh, PCI. Um, let me ask you a question. I will put the same question later to Alex, but let me start by, by you to this important question. What would be your advice to any colleague who is trying to transition to performing PCI without contrast? What would be, you know, valuable advice in, in terms of how to proceed, how, what techniques to incorporate, and how to ensure the safety of the patient? 
Sure. And I think that's the key point you mentioned there, Javier, is that, you know, the safety of the patient. So here we're trying to balance providing safety, protecting the kidneys. However, we're using a lot of techniques that are quite advanced. What we've generally found is by, you know, um, using these techniques, it's, it's a, a, a journey and you don't go from doing standard PCI with angiography to doing PCI without any contrast. You gradually use the intracoronary imaging techniques and the techniques show to gradually reduce the amount of contrast you're doing, where you then get to the stage that you feel comfortable doing cases, giving very little contrast. In our journey, what we learned quite early on is that actually, you know, often we're using contrast far too generously. And even in our day-to-day -day PCI, our contrast use has gone down with adoption of these techniques. So number one, safety is paramount. It's a journey, get um, used to using a high amount of intracoronary imaging, and then actually, you know, um, it's good to, to work with people who are using these techniques because what you don't want to do is go from one extreme to the other um, and then risk complication. Uh, but in, in, in a way, it looks like the most important aspect is a change in mindset because things as simple as, uh, as Alex showing us, you know, to use the diluted contrast, for example, is something that for many colleagues may pass an advertise. Alex, what, the same question to you. I can only really agree what Bilal is talking about. I think these are techniques you have to implement in your cath lab anyway, um, if you want to do a, um, a proper state-of-the-art PCI. And the more you move forward, you realize that you need less and less contrast anyway, not only in CKD patients, but in your daily practice anyway. And once you are um, like happy with your environment and you're safe in what you're doing, um, you can even um, reduce contrast um, uh, from that. But uh, the, the key point, I think, is implementing these new technologies. Don't be afraid of using them in your daily practice and then go from there and you will um, use less and less uh, contrast anyway. Thank you very much. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been a great session. I think that we have learned uh, the importance of developing competence in the techniques that allow ultra low contrast uh, and zero for contrast uh, PCI. Um, also, we, we learned, you know, that uh, many of the techniques are already available in our cat labs, but uh, particularly the use of intracoronary imaging co registered uh, with um, the wire without contrast, physiology, uh, stent boost, uh, enhance, stent enhancement is uh, tremendously used. Um, I think that also um, we, we highlighted that these uh, skills are useful not only to prevent um, um, contrast in nephropathy, but also can be used in many different uh, PCI scenarios. So thank you very much, uh, Bilal, Alex, uh, for your contribution to this uh, session. Thank you very much to all of you who have posted uh, questions uh, online. Thank you to Nieves Gonzalo as uh, chat masters. And uh, we wish you a great uh, Euro PCR 2021. Stay um, in touch for the next uh, very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.